Hey there, Dave here along with Chris and Jordan. Welcome to Dumb Money Live. Today, we're gonna to be talking about the $2 trillion stimulus. What does it mean for stocks? Is this the ultimate buying opportunity? Or is this a bull trap that pushes things up for a bit and then we go crashing back down? We'll tell you how we are trading this market and more coming up. This is Dumb Money Live with Chris Camillo, Dave Hansen, and Jordan McLean. Streaming live on YouTube, we are Dumb Money. So even after today's record high jobless claims report and cases of Corona continuing to increase, the market has actually opened up <clears throat> the third day in the row. Is the bottom behind us? I can tell you I'm not trading this like we've seen the bottom, but for now, I've removed my big short hedge on the SPY. Uh, I just have a small number of put options, kind of in a just in case scenario. Have you guys gone fully long at this point? Great, great, great question, Dave. Um, yes, I, I, I well, I don't want to say fully long. I've been fully long over the past 48 hours for a few hours at a time. I've been kind of, I took off most of my short position like you. Uh, I'm now trading somewhere between 15 and 40 percent hedge, uh, depending on the day, depending on the moment, depending on the news flow of what I'm reading and what I'm seeing. So I, you know, I am very much long. I have not been this long uh, since early February. So it's a big change of events. And I think we're going to spend a lot of time in this episode talking about that. Why did I have that decision? Um, what is the stimulus? You said two trillion. It's actually six trillion. And I'm going to spend some time today talking about what the other four trillion is because that is really the main focus of what uh, most of Wall Street and uh, you know a lot of hedge funds, quant funds, they're really focused on that extra four trillion. And I think that's an area that a lot of retail traders just just don't understand what that is or what the impact is long term for the economy and the stock market. How about you, Jordan? What what is your what, what have you done since we last were on the air? Um, I bought a few things on a, it was either Monday or Tuesday. I bought some <clears throat> airline stocks. I bought a couple of things that were like super depressed. Um, but I'm still sitting. Um, See, on, I stayed out of those airline I, stocks. I, I kind of wish I had. Are you you got into JetBlue, right? Yeah, I got into JetBlue. Uh, based on yeah, Chris mentioned JetBlue, and I've I've been kind of looking at what I was going to pick up in airlines, anyways. And I'm I'm up forty something percent in it so far. <laughs> me, me, me. When, when did you get in at? I got in at eight eight dollars and ten cents. I think is what I bought in at. Yeah, you like for me. I'm like eight and a half. Yeah, just under eight and a half. And I was just on the sidelines for that one and kicking myself, like I often do when I when you guys do a trade and I'm. I'm not left out of it. Um, but I don't think that, you know, I think that this is a big run up and I think the stimulus, you know, pushed these things up, but do you really long term think that the airlines saw their bottom and you're staying in JetBlue or is this just very short term? Yeah. yeah yes. I, 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 well, not necessarily. Let me explain why we got into JetBlue and, and why I sent out that text. I don't know, it was a couple of days ago saying, Hey guys, I'm doing some bottom picking and one of the stocks I'm buying is JetBlue. Uh, the reason for that is when we're following the stimulus bill, uh, one of the things that I was looking out for was the degree of penalization for the airlines and for Boeing uh, and, and for companies that needed to take out this big debt. And it became pretty apparent once the bill, the specifics of the bill started leaking, uh, that it was going to get passed without any form of severe uh, di massive dilution. It was really just going to be regular debt um, that the airlines could withstand. You know, they'll, they'll penalize salaries at the corporate level, no big deal at the executive level, and they'll restrict share buybacks. So, you know, that being said, JetBlue is one of the strongest balance sheets uh, in the entire airline industry. I think them along with Southwest and Delta is pretty good too. Delta is pretty good. Um, but, you know, we, we read that, you know, one of the sell side reports last week, if you recall, and it kind of broke down all the airlines and their mm -hmm. balance sheets. And in the event that they needed to take out government debt, which ones were going to be most likely to thrive in that situation and which ones were still at risk. And JetBlue was one of those companies uh, that was kind of positioned to thrive. And I like JetBlue because I don't believe they do a whole lot of international flights. 
Uh, you know, I think it's mostly domestic here. I also think that JetBlue being on the East Coast, they got hit pretty hard, right? Uh, I think the East Coast just might be taking this a little bit more seriously now than the rest of the country and might actually come out of this a little bit sooner. I don't want to be in JetBlue for the next five years. This is honestly, this is a rebound play the same way that Royal Caribbean was a rebound play. At the same time I bought that, remember guys, or right before that, I bought, I bought more, I bought shares. Uh, I'm so, I love it. I bought 23 bucks a share. I got Royal Caribbean at $23 a share. So I was at my other rebound trade. I got a, basically, I had three big rebound trades uh, mm. that I put in. And this is purely based on the lack of, of penalization and the stimulus dollars. One was Royal Caribbean, one was JetBlue, and the other was Ford. Um, I picked up a whole bunch of shares of Ford. At, ready for this? It was like, what was it? $5? No, no, $4 flat. It was a yeah. four. Or something, I think it was. Yep. Um, I got some Ford. So, you know, those those are stocks that I don't want to be in for a long period of time. It was purely based on this whole rebound stimulus thing. Yeah, and I didn't. I didn't play a single rebound stock. Um, I did close my short on the spy, like I mentioned. Uh, I closed my short on Yelp. Uh, I did both of those on Tuesday. I um, I did a quick temporary intraday trade. And I think you did as well, Chris, on the Dow F ETF. Um, yeah, it didn't work out. Tuesday. It didn't work. It, it And it was just slightly uh, profitable for me. It was that that's a that's one of those days the uh, market was just up and down. And, yeah. uh, you know, today's big gains that we're seeing, what, what is the uh, the S&P is up 4.7% right now. The Nasdaq's up 3.75. The Dow's up 5%. The Dow is being pushed up, though, by Boeing yeah. because of the way the Dow is weighted based on price instead of market cap. So it's artificially making the market look better than it is, in my opinion. And can, we talk, can we talk about Boeing for a second, Jordan? Me yeah. and Jordan were both short Boeing. And while I didn't make one penny on Boeing, I am so proud and happy that I got out of Boeing at about 114 a share is when I kind of cleared out of that short. Again, right around the same time that I saw that the stimulus was actually going to get passed and it was not going, they weren't going to fight this whole kind of just, you know, take all the equity out of these companies. I was like, I got to get out of this Boeing short. Yeah. Uh, Jordan, how about you? Yeah, I, I actually bought puts. So I, uh, I ended up worse off than you. I lost about I don't know, 60% of my money on the puts but you got out of the puts oh yeah. yeah yeah okay okay good good and by the way i want to talk about what we didn't we weren't able to do because we talked a lot about this capitulation event right that that, that who knows it could absolutely still come right we haven't had that yet this is basically this massive downdraft where we see lows well below what what people were anticipating and there's massive panic in the market uh, massive volume capitulation. I think we, it would have to be 25% lower than where we are today, maybe 18 or 15 to 20% lower than where we were a couple days ago, right? So that never happened. Remember, if that happened, remember what we were going to do? We we're going to, I was going to put half a million dollars in, in option, right? Call options on those five companies. I couldn't do it, right? And I, I'm so upset that, well, not upset because I hate for the market to go down that much, but I think it would rebound quickly if it did. I wasn't able to place those trades. Now, it still could happen uh, if it do and I want to I want to you know explain something here. Everyone thinks that this market is going to follow history, but there has is very little history for these type of black swan events. And every type of black swan event is different. And what makes this That's what makes one it a black swan? There's there's no history, and so the market is trying to trade on their expectations, but. We don't know what that longer term view is going to be. We don't. We can't predict how quickly the curve will level. We can't predict what the impact on the <clears throat> unemployment will be, on spending, on on all of these things that keep the economy going, or the level, the record amount of stimulus that is yes. being put into this economy. Like, we can't deal. predict yeah, the, the impact of that. The Fed can't predict it. Nobody can predict it. Yeah, the Fed and the and the government have never done anything like this before in any other bear market. So it's like, 
what's the effect of this? And I don't think anybody really knows. So yeah. that's, that's the wrench. That's the wrench that got thrown into all this stuff was the $6 trillion stimulus. It's never been done. In fact, not only has it never been done, nothing has been done that even comes remotely close. Not, this is magnitudes greater than anything that's ever been done. And because of that, we just, I think the, what we want to say on the show was we do not know what's going to happen in the short term at all. Like there's, there's just no way to predict in the next 30 days what the market is going to do because we, on one hand, we have this insane stimulus and on the other, we have an event that could honestly get way worse than what anyone anticipates or could be about what we, you know, what we're anticipating is, which is bad, really bad, but then slowly getting better, right? We just don't have any of those answers yet. Yeah, and you, really and you hear everyone on anybody that's comparing this to like what happened around the Great Depression, which I hear so many times, the government's doing the exact opposite of what they did then. So back then, the Fed basically did nothing. Uh, the federal government ran a balanced budget for five years. I mean, it's totally we're, we're doing the opposite. Jordan, you're so correct. You're so so correct. Now, now that said. What happened, you know, after the big market crash of what was it, 29, a yeah. year later? Or what was it? Or was it 1918? I, I forget what it was. I'm sorry. But but after that crash, we didn't we have a massive, massive rally, right? That following year. Yeah. Maybe we don't have the rally because of the stimulus now, and maybe it comes quicker. We just don't know. And it would be insane for us to think we know what we're doing here. And yeah. because of that, I am being very careful with short-term options because the option premiums are really high. I do not want to get caught up trying to trade this market day in and day out. That's just not something I'm willing to do right now. So all I'm willing to do right now is keep all of my longs and basically put a small hedge just in case this market does have that big downdraft. And if that happens, the money that I make off that hedge position is money that when we do see a capitulation, if that actually happens, is the money that I'll take and and buy into those long dated leverage call options in those five companies that we talked about. I think it was last episode or the episode before that. Um, I'm, that that's my entire game plan here. Long term, this has got to be, I think, long term, I'm really feeling that this has to be a, a huge market rally at some point going in the next 18 months, right? 12 to 18 months. Uh, once we get a vaccine and we're back to normal, I, I just feel my gut tells me this is, we're going to get through this at some point. Right. And so yeah. the risk reward of not being long here is scary. Isn't it scary to you not being long enough here long term? No, and that's why I am, I am long. And then from time to time, I just put that little, uh, I, I put the brakes on. I put the pause button on on my account just because you you never know. And so, like this morning, I was completely long, but I had a small put on the spy just in case these jobless numbers came out and they were mm. way worse than anyone was expecting because because that might have moved the market down. Now, I think that you know we saw record uh, jobless claims and. That was what the market was expecting. And we'd never seen more than like 600,000 and we had 2 million, but that was what the market was expecting. And so uh, the market went up. Yeah. So, so I want to, by the way, I want to talk to our uh, followers. We're going to get to all these comments. I'm seeing them. There's some great comments. For those of y'all that haven't watched any prior episodes of Dumb Money Live, I was talking about the market. You know, understand that we are trading for ourselves, we're trading some pretty substantial accounts. Uh, I'm trading what is now, as a result of this, turned into you know an eight-figure trading account. Um, my account is up uh, almost, I think I want to say 40% in the last four weeks. Okay, My total portfolio account is up 40% in the last four or five weeks since I started shorting on February 20th, I think it was. So we basically nailed uh, this downturn in the market. Some of us have traded it more aggressively than others, who mean Dave and Jordan. Uh, but we either retained a lot of our equity through this downturn, or in the case of me, that was trading at aggressively short, uh, starting with Wing Casinos and another, another, all the really all the travel companies from Booking.com to TripAdvisor to Yelp. I've been shorting every single one of them over the past month. This has been the best uh, month of my 32-year trading career. Uh, that said, 
uh, this is our portfolio. We're trading for ourselves. We're not financial advisors. We're not providing advice. Don't do what we do. Your risk is different than our risk, okay? So just be very careful. We're here to educate and entertain. Um, but I want to get into some of these questions at some point. Someone, Dave and Jordan, just asked, how does the government, I want, I want, can I talk about the four bill, the four trillion yes. of the six trillion? How did, okay. how did, how did two trillion turn into six trillion? Okay. This is, this is maybe the most important element of the entire stimulus deal is that the Fed, okay, the Fed has the ability to pump an additional four trillion dollars on top of the guaranteed two trillion dollars to support markets. Now, what does that mean? They can pump that money into municipalities, all right? So they can help basically add liquidity to municipal bonds, right? The municipal bond market, but also, and this is totally unprecedented, the Fed can pump up to $4 trillion into the corporate bond market, okay? So what does that actually mean? That means that any company anywhere, right, that trades on our exchanges or not, uh, the, the Fed can come in and say, you know what, you're having some trouble, you might be at risk of going out of business, or even if not, you're potentially threatening to lay off thousands to tens of thousands of employees, please don't do that. We will come in and we will just issue some new corporate bonds, right? And we will buy those corporate bonds from you, giving you the money that you need to keep all those people employed, okay, to stay in business. That essentially puts a floor, right, a floor on this on these companies in terms of their downside, in theory at least, right? Now, depending on how bad, if this goes on for a year, a year and a half, and is worse than everyone anticipates, we might need a lot more than $4 trillion. But a $4 trillion floor on top of the $2 trillion guarantee is unprecedented. So how can they do this with Royal Caribbean, someone's asking? Well, there's nothing in the documentation that says that, to, that I'm aware of at least, because it hasn't been fully released, that says, that the Fed can only do this with companies that have U.S. employees or companies that are, you know, registered here in the U.S. Royal Caribbean is an American stock exchange on American exchange. Excuse me, means it has American stockholders, right? It also is something that is instrumental. These cruise companies are instrumental to the U.S. economy in a lot of ways meaning that there's an industry around the cruise industry, okay, that operates around it. And even though the people that work for the cruise companies might be foreign employees, there are potentially hundreds of thousands of people that are benefiting from the cruise country, uh, the, the cruise industry right here in the U.S. And I think that that is likely a good enough reason when the Fed has really an open bank account of four trillion dollars and trump has already said we got to protect the cruise cruise lines right um that is a good enough reason for the fed to say you know what we don't want to see carnival and royal caribbean and or we don't want to see you guys going out of business we don't want to see you stopping cruising because that will impact a lot of other industries that revolve around the cruise industry that are U.S. based. I think they're going to get their money, guys. I think they're going to live to see another day. And if we shoot over to Dave right now in that T-shirt that I, I got mine too, I'm going to wear it next episode. We <laughs> believe at Dumb Money, we believe that while cruise investments are really risky, like they could totally go bankrupt, totally could happen, definitely could totally happen, that if they don't go bankrupt, the one thing we believe is that cruisers gonna cruise okay they are gonna cruise you cannot stop them they're coming back they're gonna come back harder than you ever ever would have imagined they're gonna come back they're gonna come back in droves and they're gonna fill those cruise ships whenever they're allowed to and this thing is over with and there's gonna be so much pent-up demand for cruising and buffet lines and you all sound, you sound like a certain president i know <laughs> right right so, like, pent -up demand and buffet lines those are two of his favorite things so that's why we made some small bets, small bets on the cruise industry through Royal Caribbean. And I doubled down on those bets and I bought me some Royal Caribbean 23 bucks. Now, I hope I'm not wrong. I hope the government doesn't say we're going to leave you out to dry because it gets political and controversial over them being foreign uh, owned assets. That could definitely happen. Uh, but I think I'll take those odds right now. But listen, guys, that's why the $4 trillion is so important. But I also let, let you guys uh, talk about the $2 trillion, what you've heard about it. I want to talk about, or Dave, you could maybe even talk about how the $2 trillion is impacting restaurants and bars like ours. Because what they're about to do, while the details are a little bit sketchy, 
wow, what a package for small business. Could you believe how strong the package is? Why don't you talk about that? It's yeah, it's it's pretty amazing. Um, and I did want to I, I pulled up the quote from our uh, Fed chairman, Jerome Powell, this morning. He was on the Today Show and his quote was, this is a unique situation. It's not like a typical downturn. We've asked people to step back from economic activity, really to make an investment in our public health. They're doing that for the public good. And this bill that just got passed is going to try to provide relief and stability to those people. And the, the part of the package that affects small business where essentially small businesses like Chris's restaurant and my bar are going to be able to take out loans from banks that the government is guaranteeing that even if we don't pay them back, they will take care of it. And they're saying that as a small business owner, as long as you meet some certain criteria, you don't have to pay it back. These loans are things that small business can take out to pay things like payroll, like utilities, mm -hmm. like rent. There's, there's a list of things that small businesses will be able to borrow money. And as long as they meet the eligibility requirements, which I think basically is keeping people on payroll, trying to keep the uh, workers, even if they're not allowed to work, even if your business is shut down for the time being, it's allowing uh, those people to continue to get paid, trying to keep those unemployment numbers lower. Um, I'm not sure exactly in the restaurant industry where people are paid a special super low minimum wage and make up for it with tips. I'm not sure how that is actually going to work out or if you get to be, you know, and get to claim unemployment and pay, get, you know, get paid from the unemployment benefit and also get continue to be paid at the minimum wage. It's There's still a lot very unclear on what it actually means for primarily service industry workers where their money is coming primarily from tips. Um, but it is a huge, huge deal for some businesses. And Chris and I were talking about, are there businesses out there that would be able to take out these loans and continue to operate, but where the owner perhaps is just not wanting to go through with that, not bother with it, where we might be able to actually just buy some companies right now where yeah. we could basically buy the company, have that owner do well, be able to retire, and then take over with free government money for the first few months of operating the business. Is, is there an opportunity there? Yeah. So, and I think if it weren't for all the opportunities in public markets, I would have more time to look at those. Mm -hmm. so, there's opportunity all over the place, right? So we'll eventually yeah. we'll get there. But, you know, the thing is, the government, it looks like they're going to basically pay us small businesses somewhere between 50 and 100% of our expenses for the next three to four months. So that is incredible. And it's going to keep so many people employed. It's going to keep that unemployment number somewhat in check. I mean, we'll, we'll have to figure out. I don't know. Next week could be ugly. Uh, but I know we're not laying off anyone at my restaurant. Uh, we want that government money. Uh, and we want to hopefully subsidize our losses with it. And hopefully at the end of this, we're not going to lose as much money as we thought and we'll be able to stay open. I think it's a really big deal for us. Um, I want to say someone's asking about the video game industry. Uh, we've had some conversations the last few days. We, we promised on our last episode, I used to spend a tremendous amount. I, I almost considered myself a video game analyst eight, nine, ten years ago. It's all, really all I did. Um, haven't traded the sector in a while. But I did take a quick peek uh, back into one of my old favorites, Activision. Um, and they uh, look to be really strong right now through this quarter. Uh, just doing some Google search uh, of their games, uh, no doubt. I mean, the, the volume of play there for their, um, ah, what, what's their, I can't believe I just forgot the name of their game, their uh, fighting game. Uh, Call some of Duty. Call of Duty, yeah. They basically have a call. They, they, they have they have a free to play Call of Duty that works on microtransactions. There's never been a better time to have a microtransaction type game go viral. Uh, and I think you know the search trends on that are absolutely phenomenal right now. I think Activision is going to be one of the big winners. So I made I made a strong investment in Activision a few days ago. It's not up that much because it's not considered a rebound stock. It's really not trading that much lower. <laughs> it's all time highs. But I think Activision is going to be a strong, strong trade here, um, although not necessarily a rebound trade, but it has, I think, lower downside risk. Um, so if we do see a big downdraft in the market, uh, I think that Activision for me is almost a defensive play that will do pretty well if we recover. And if we don't recover, I think it will also do pretty well. Um, 
Uh, what else? Do you, you, you want to answer some questions? We we could go through our uh, comments. Well, here's I, one I, uh, from uh, Fairview Properties. Are you, how are you feeling about the market? Are you still expecting a pullback as cases explode across the country? We we kind of touched on that earlier. There, for me, I'm I'm you know fully long right now with a small hedge on the downside, but um, I think that the market isn't going to be just as as all the commentators on CNBC are saying, are we going to see a U shape or a V shape or an L shape as the market comes back? I'm thinking U. I don't think L. I don't think the economy is just going to fall apart. But I think that as we have these multiple day, we've had three days where the market's going up. I think that there's going to be another you know week where we see it down and then it's up and then it's down. So it's it's just have you have to be more tuned in to the market now than ever before. You know, we, we've had years, we've had a decade almost where the, where basically you just buy a stock and you're going to, you're printing money and it's, it's doing nothing but go up. You may have a down day, but no, it's, it's going up. Now your entire portfolio can be whipsawed so, so dramatically that I'm, I'm hedging uh, on and off. So, so let's talk about the base case and what would be worse than that. I think the base case right now that everyone is assuming is we have to run these um, models, right? So what we do a lot of um, is basically modeling different scenarios. And I think the base case scenario that the market's looking for right now, someone has some TV in their background. Is that you, you Jordan? Or Dave? Oh. So I think the base, the base case uh, is that this virus will kind of settle down going into the summer, right? I think everyone, I don't think anyone's buying into the whole Easter thing that Trump talked about. That that just seems insane. And I don't think the yeah. base case is Easter. I think the base case is probably closer to a, everybody kind of getting back out into the world in June. Um, and I think if, if the data leads us to believe uh, that it's going to be worse than June, I think you'll see the market start to potentially come apart. Um, if it looks like we're going to lose the summer, that's a really, really bad sign, obviously, for the travel industry and other industries. And then we're kind of relying on a fourth stimulus package, right? And then, by the way, that fourth stimulus package, that's the one that people are really going to battle over between the House and the Senate. Um, so that's the one that, that one can get really ugly. If we're forced to do a fourth package, watch out it really in stable time, unstable times that that has to happen. Mm -hmm. So know what the base case is and then start to read the data based on the data being better or worse than the base case. And it has to be really considerably better or considerably worse, I think, uh, to move the market substantially, uh, from that base case scenario. By the way, someone just mentioned Cisco, not Cisco Systems, but S-Y-S-C-O. This is the food supplier uh, to basically most of the world's schools and companies and restaurants for sure, right? Like they're like maybe what the largest supplier to restaurants. Um, yep. I have been wanting to do research into Cisco uh, for the last couple of weeks, and I just haven't had the time, but I'm going to commit to spending some time on Cisco today and tomorrow because I think that you know, Cisco has rebounded like all the other stocks have over the last few days. But my gut tells me that Cisco potentially could get slaughtered over the next few months um, if a lot of these restaurants don't really open up again. Now, there's still food delivery business, of course. But I think the food delivery, I mean, what do you guys think? Is it 10 or 15 percent of what it normally would be? At my restaurant, we're running numbers right now and we're at like less than 7% of what we would normally serve in term, terms of food. Yeah, you're not the typical food delivery restaurant though, or, you know, take yeah, out restaurants. Yeah, restaurants. yeah I think there, there's exceptions to the rule, but if you look at all restaurants, right, nationally, I think that it has to be down, you know, has to be down over 50, 60%, 70%. Like you remember that report on, uh, uh, what was it called, well, booking.com, excuse me, uh, open table, it's down 100% on, on bookings, right? And, and that has to be 70, 80, 90% uh, of, of restaurant revenue. Yeah. So Cisco, I think, could potentially be a nice hedge and it's something to stay short. Um, but I haven't done the research yet. I, I need to do the work. And we'll talk about it on, on Monday, I guess, our next episode. I see people mentioning Lululemon. Um, so I actually picked up some Lulu um, on Tuesday. Um, after I heard that Nike actually, um, uh, so they were down a little bit this, uh, 
you know, this month, but their online sales did help um, kind of offset some of their store sales. And so I'm thinking it's going to be the same thing for Lulu to where they'll, you know, they'll probably remove guidance like everybody else is doing. They'll, uh, they'll be a little bit weaker, but I think a lot of people will be shopping online for things right now. So that could yeah. help them a little bit. And also they're so depressed and it's a great name. So oh, oh, it, it's better than a great name, Jordan. It's literally one of the best names. Yeah. I mean, it, you, how do you even get better than Lulu? It's, it's as good as it gets. They are killing it obviously right up until this started yeah. and everyone's about to get checks right everyone's getting these what thousand dollar to two thousand dollar checks not everyone but most people um and they are stuck at home and they're gonna do online shopping and i think they're gonna hit up their favorites i agree i think i think nike mm -hmm. i think lulu i think and not that lulu is not going to get destroyed in the next couple months because it absolutely will but that's one of the companies that when this whole thing is over with Oh man, I, I can't own enough Lulu when this whole thing. Well, look, I think it's you also got you've got like a tale of two economies, right? You've got a lot of people that are doing really bad, but you've got a lot of people that you know their job really hasn't changed that much, but they're not going out as much, they're not doing as much, and so they might even have some additional discretionary income, and so they're like, yeah, you know what, I'm going to buy those pants or that whatever. Um, and so maybe people are shopping online more. I don't know. I'm just saying that's a possibility. No, Jordan, what you're saying is actually genius. And it's something that no one's talking about because think about this. Everybody's getting the checks that makes under 100K, right? It makes 75 to 100, under 75K, you get the whole check. Under 100K, you get most of the check. So think about this. Unemployment was 3 million. There's what, 300 million people. Let's call it, I don't know, 220 million adults in the country, right? So, you, we lost a few million people, all right? So almost everybody is still employed, yet almost everybody is about to get a check for between one and $2,000. So what you just said is so brilliant and it's completely going undiscussed right now and because everyone is getting the same amount of money that they have been getting for the most part. And call it 90, 95%, and call it 90%. Same amount of money that they always were and then they get this bonus check. What are they going to do with it, right? What are they going to do with it? That's the question we need to answer. And if you can yeah. figure out what they're going to do with that check, um, buy a new MacBook because they're stuck at home and they're having to like, the, now they're at college doing all their college work from home with their kids. Their kids are doing all their work from home for the next couple months or they're, they want to, they don't even have a television, but they want to watch a ton of Netflix. They're just watching movies all day. Like buy a new MacBook, right? Buy a new iPad, right? Like that, I, I think Apple is, is going to benefit again not that they're going to do more sales now than they would have done before but it might not be as bad for certain companies as you think because they're about to get hundreds of billions of dollars of people in people's pockets that they're going to immediately spend right yeah i mean i would personally buy stocks but you know <laughs> we'll put your twelve hundred dollars in stocks and yeah absolutely you know, you, you, you hear the uh, the financial people telling you, don't treat this like a bonus check because you don't know what's coming. And this is just a one time payment. So that's, you know, that's the advice that's being given. But the reality is for all of the people who have retained their job and are just nervous, but not necessarily thinking they're going to uh, be terminated. Um, there's I agree. I think I think companies like Apple uh, where where it's down and buying Apple at 254 is uh, is a substantial discount. I, that's, I, I want to buy more of the companies that I like, the ones that I know are going to survive long term. And uh, it's it's not a game of like trying to find the bottom for me. It's, it's more a game of, does this stock look reasonable at this price? Yes, absolutely. If I could buy Apple, if, if you told me back in February that Apple was available for $250 a share, I'd be all over it. <laughs> so, Dave, you know what else? You know what I think people are going to spend money on? Uh, you know what everybody wants to do right now? They've been stuck in their houses, right? Uh, mm -hmm. they've been stuck in their houses. And I know for a fact that people are dying for one thing. You know what they're dying for? A vacation. And you know what's going to be really expensive to do when this is all, all over with? It's going to be really expensive to go on a vacation, but there's one type of vacation out there that's going to not be so expensive. And it's going to come with a full refund if you need to cancel. I bet you a lot of people are going to get those checks 
and they're gonna book themselves a cruise. Okay, I think <laughs> you're gonna book themselves a cruise. I'm telling you, I think I quit. I'm done. It's gonna have you're wearing the shirt. You gotta be. <laughs> I think they're gonna book a cruise. You know it. You know it. They're gonna book a cruise for 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 holiday season of next year when the vaccine is hopefully getting closer or we're beyond this. They're gonna book one for next spring or summer 2021. I'll tell you what I'm not going to do. I'm not going to be booking a cruise, but I was thinking about this the other day. I don't want to go on an airplane right now. I don't want to go anywhere, but are the airlines going to continue these uh, policies of uh, loosening up the change restrictions? And with the super low airfare right now, is could you could you buy some tickets and then change them? Or when you change them, you then have to change them into the new fare at the new higher price. Could you buy futures in airline tickets? Could you say, I know that within a year, I'm going to want to be able to go to Europe. Yeah. Could you buy a ticket to London today for $107 and just book it three years out and just say, yeah, I'm going to, I'm going to take that, that flight. I don't think so. I think they're <laughs> like, I think the restrictions are, I think it's pretty short term with what they're offering in terms of cancellations and cheap fares. Um, but you know, I, I, I don't know. By the way, uh, Wolf of Dubai, stocks investing at 1129. You know, Chris, how can we follow your trades real time? You're the most active and successful trader and see trends really well. Well, thank you. Uh, so how do we do that for the dumb money community? That'd be great. I get asked that all the time, guys. Listen, it's a dangerous game. I, I would never do that because it's not really, it's not what we're about. I We do not want you mimicking our trades because it's dangerous. It, it, it puts us at financial liability a legal liability. It's not something we want to do. We will occasionally point out trades that we're making and explain why we're doing them for education purposes, because we want you to understand how we think. And we want to train you to think like a social ARB investor, right? Uh, that's why, you know, by the way, we're giving out the books there. I still have a ton left. I haven't done them yet, but I think I'm going to do them this next week, Dave, if I can for my house, because I got plenty of time. Uh, yeah, absolutely. What's the link for that? Dumbmoney.tv forward slash book. Book, yeah. And if you live in the United States and you just put your address on there, we're going to mail you a free $25 hardback book. I bought a bunch of them from the publisher years ago, and I just, I'm just i going to give them all away now. So we'll just give them out for free. It's Laughing at Wall Street. You can check it out on Amazon, Laughing at Wall Street. If you live outside the U.S., you can buy an ebook if you want. Listen, I don't make literally hardly any money. My publisher makes all the money, not me. So that's why I'm giving away the hardbacks. Uh, I and the hardbacks them. that you give away are ones that you actually had to pay for because <laughs> you wanted to be able to give them out at trade shows and stuff. Right? Yeah. The, the so you have a warehouse that you're still paying like rent to keep these things stored at public storage. And now you just want to give them all away. So here's the thing. I paid, I think I bought a few thousand books for three bucks a copy for my publisher because I let the authors do that when they first print them. Like I can buy extras for myself. And I've been paying 230 bucks a month to store these things in storage. It is, I've lost so much money on just storing my books that I'm ready to give them all out now to people that care enough to read it. Um, and they're $25 a piece, right? <laughs> read hardback books. And we're going to pay to send them to you, which is what, three, four bucks a book to send in the US? Yeah. Which is why we can't do it internationally, because when we uh, started trying to mail them internationally, we had one that was like $37 to mail. Yeah. It doesn't yeah. make sense. We're doing it's, well. It'd be cheaper just to buy the book locally. We're doing well, but not that well. Oh, can we talk about one other thing? Dave, can you pull up the website of a company that we are about to invest in, the local company? It's the uh, the 3D, what's it called? The 3D uh, printing yeah, company. Yeah, what is, what's their website? Laz all right, here, here. It's laz3d.com. So they have pivoted their entire business model for the next couple months. They are actually manufacturing their own face mask, okay, and their own plastic hoods for hospital workers and selling them at like almost their cost. It's insane. I'm like, why don't you guys make some money off of this? And they're just like, like, oh, we want to support the hospital workers. They're selling these things for next to nothing. So. I actually uh, called the local hospital here, UT Southwestern in Dallas, Texas, and I uh, wrote them a check for $10,000 to buy these masks uh, from this startup, uh, laz3d.com. And they are, they're getting hundreds of thousands of these things that they're manufacturing. And for any hospital, if you know a hospital that they're not N95s, but in combination with the thing that goes over your hood, a lot of hospitals are wearing these. 
If you know of a hospital that wants to buy these, please refer them to laz3d.com. It's a Texas company. They're manufacturing them direct. These are one of the most brilliant uh, 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 doctors that own this, that are founders of this company. And I donated $10,000 of equipment, PPE equipment from this company to UT Southwestern here in Dallas. And I highly recommend spreading the word because they're just trying to help. And I, I love founders that are doing this type of stuff to help the hospital. Don't you think these are the real heroes, like these hospital workers? Is that not? Absolutely. Have you it's, ever been so proud to be like the, the proud of people in your life than the people? The that hospital workers are absolutely, they are, they are the front line. I think, I think, Veterans Day should include doctors uh, in the, this next year. It's um, because it's scary what's going on in hospitals in New York and some of the the videos that are out on the internet of of what they're having to do to you know have their own makeshift uh, protective gear made out of trash bags and and duct tape. It's uh, it's remarkable. So companies like laz3d.com that have pivoted their entire business to start making this protective gear. Um, I saw 3M is expected to deliver some crazy high number of uh, the, the 95 masks and the next, you know, like they, they've pivoted their production. It's, it's, cra it's crazy how, how all industry has jumped on board and, and is really trying to make the difference here. Uh, can we talk about someone's asking uh, who, about Roku here, Brandon Mullins at 11.30. Asked guys, what's up with Roku rallied when the markets are down, now yep. down when the markets are up. I mean, we've seen quite a bit of this. Um, it's the reason why is because Roku is seen as a company that might benefit uh, when people are at home watching a lot of programming, right? And so kind of like Netflix, they, they did better than you would expect when the markets were down, but now the markets are going up and people are rushing to buy the stocks that are down 40, 50, 60, 70%. They're not rushing to buy the companies like Activision, right? That that are, and, and Roku, that, that aren't as down as much, at least relative to other companies. Um, also, Roku is kind of a speculative company a little bit. I think people right now, they wanna buy, they wanna buy companies where they have a, they're getting a guaranteed, right? A guaranteed uh, revenue line and profit line. So, you know, and there's the chart of Roku, and it is, you know, still still down from its highs. It's recovered about halfway, it looks like. And and over the past five days, as the market goes up, they are trending down. It's it's a sign of like that. That's like the inverse stock. You know, maybe maybe that's a good one. Um, I actually would like to own some Roku. I, oh, I like their business model now that I understand it. By and the way. actually. Do you know what I? Now that I've like sequestered myself into this like upstairs office that I that I built and moved televisions, I have multiple screens here. I didn't have cable coming up here. My Direct TV wasn't designed to go all the way to the third floor. I have multiple Roku televisions that I, I bought a Roku stick. I have a TV that has Roku built in. All I'm watching all day. I, I have like three of them up here. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 I'm an advertisement for buying like the stocks that you actually use. So I, you know, when I switched all of my computers to Apple back when the first mm -hmm. iPhone came out, I bought Apple stock and that was an amazing thing to do. Now that I'm watching three Roku TVs at the same time, maybe I should buy some Roku. See, everything I do is on Apple TV. I think it's weird that you bought Roku TVs. Hey, for twelve dollars, they shipped this uh, entire thing that that took an older TV that was 1080 but didn't have any built-in screening. Yeah. It's like a it's a Samsung, and you know their terrible on-screen interface doesn't have TV. At least it didn't back at the time. I don't I don't know even know what they have now. Yeah. But Roku was super easy. I also bought an Amazon Fire yeah. stick to try that out. Like literally, you don't have any idea how many TVs I'm watching right now. It's it's out of control. But um, I had to. I'm I'm returning this Fire Stick because I couldn't get my Direct TV login to work on it, and it works flawlessly on Roku. So everybody puts that into iTunes, and I get I put Apple TVs on all of our TVs. There's like we've only got like four TVs. We're not nuts, but like that way everything's the same. We don't have to oh. have weird Roku and Amazon. We, we we have nine TVs all with Apple but Apple TV but but Dave everyone loves everywhere Roku. else in the house I have Apple TV but yeah. in this temporary solution 
where I'm moving TVs that that were plugged into the whole house network, I had to buy a bunch of uh, these these streaming. It's 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 amazing. And I actually got the voice one now. I'm trying it out. I haven't used the voice feature, but okay. So Felton was asking about Boeing, Chris. No, no, he's also asking about. I'll get that, but he's asking about Lulu. He said a hundred thousand dollar income people are not buying Lulu. I could not agree more, Feldman, dude. I, like Feldman's our buddy. He'll be on the episode next week. Uh, dude, aspirational buying has never been bigger. I know so many girls that do not make a hundred K a year that are wearing Lulu and buying Lulu. Um, they absolutely, it might not be their core, core, core audience, but certainly aspirationally when these people get checks in the mail, they're already buying Lulu to some extent and they'll probably buy more of it. I think it's a brand that's going to reach down into that aspirational market. So I, I disagree. Uh, they're buying it. I think, I think they'll benefit some. What did you say about Boeing? Oh, he was asking about Boeing. And my problem with Boeing is the Max is a disaster. I mean, we've all read about how the software is a disaster, but just the design of the plane itself, I don't know if it's fixable. Um, the whole problem is that there's not as much ground clearance underneath the 737 to shove a huge engine like they did on the Airbus because the Airbus had more ground clearance. And so now they had to reconfigure where the engine sits. And then they're trying to solve the whole problem with software. I don't know how they're going to fix it. And so going forward, yeah, I mean, they might get a bump from this whole thing, but would I want to be invested in it long term? I'm not going to be. No, nah, it's just not. It, it, listen, there's risk there that I think it's hard for anyone, us included, to really have an information edge on a company like Boeing, right? And what's going on there. So it's like, I'm not interested because we're social ARB investors. We invest where we're able to identify change uh, earlier than the market uh, through our reading mostly of social data. Uh, that's kind of what we do. It's what we've always done. So if, if when we get back to normal, we're really only investing in stocks that we think are underappreciated by Wall Street because Wall Street has a disconnect uh, with the general consumer and the consumer marketplace. Wall Street is disconnected from culture, okay? They don't really understand how quickly culture changes, how consumer buying patterns change. And that is the core of our investing methodology is getting ahead of institutional investors to basically buy and sell those stocks of companies that are either on the front line of that cultural or consumer buying behavior uh, change. Um, and Boeing is not one where we can easily do that. So you're not gonna hear us talking a lot about you know, financial stocks or Boeing or industrial mm -hmm. stocks. You're going to see us talking more about stocks where we're able to extract meaningful data early using tools like Google Trends, uh, like our old company ticker tags, monitoring social data, whether it's directly on Twitter. Um, we monitor Reddit boards. Uh, you know, we're out there constantly scraping data and looking at what people are doing that where Wall Street is just a little bit slower uh, to kind of capture those changes. Um, by the way, guys, what do you think, of, speaking of changing culture, we had the dumb money and our wives and a couple of our other friends, we had our first couple's Zoom happy hour yesterday or two days ago? Two what days ago, yeah. There you go. I mean, I, you were on it longer than me. You, I heard you guys were on it after we got off for a while. Yeah, I hung out with Dave for a little bit and, and their friend from Colorado. <laughs> But, but it, it is a change in culture where you now like we haven't been able to hang out. You know, we we have lunch together pretty much like four out of five days. Uh, the three of us, the time that we get to talk now is through these live streams, mm -hmm. which we are streaming, you know, for everybody to to join in. And it's great seeing you guys, by the way. I miss I miss having our lunches. <laughs> but we're at the point now where the culture is kind of learning how to live in a new stay at home economy. And I think that using zoom and other technologies like it to get together is perhaps maybe just maybe this is something that even when you don't have to stay home, maybe you'll keep doing this. Like if it was fun to just hang out and have, have some cocktails and chat with your friends online. Well, so think about this, your friend from Colorado, would you have zoomed with her before this or did this opportunity? To see a friend in another state, and now you're like, oh, we'll just zoom her. It's no big deal. Yeah, literally, I, I hadn't uh, zoomed and, and probably wouldn't have even thought to zoom until we're now just locked up. Normally, that might have been just a few texts back and forth, but it was really cool to catch up, you know? 
I could see like families doing this, right? So like, you know, my, my family, we text each other and stuff and we send photos and we talk to each other and we'll FaceTime each other. But, you know, I could see like, even like my parents, me, my brother, my sister, you know, like all of us just getting on a Zoom once in a while and just talking that way. It's, it's, it's kind of cool actually. Oh yeah, there it was. There's us. Here's, here's the beginning of our um, of our Zoom party. We we need to do it again. What we should actually do, and I was telling Chris this, we should do like an open ended happy hour for all of our viewers and just <clears throat> stream it. Like have all the boxes going. I I don't know that you'd be able to actually talk to anyone one on one. It would be really cool. This is what the house party app should have been. It should have been like you can see everybody and then you select three people and you go into a subgroup and have a conversation. And then you jump back out just like you would do at a actual house party or at a bar or whatever. Hey, Dave, can you pull up a Google Trends chart? Nolan Antonucci at 1150 says the Google Trends for Shopify login versus Shopify cancel over the last 12 months and 30 days look encouraging. You know, we do a tremendous amount of uh, G Trend research at Dumb Money, and it, it's all about the keywords and benchmarks and, and really understanding how to interpret this data. Uh, another give, data me the, give me the terms again. Uh, Shopify login versus Shopify cancel over the past 12 months, and then he says over the last 30 days, look encouraging. So maybe pull 12 month first. Um, I usually pull uh, five years when I do G search. And, and one of the trades that I went in a little deeper on uh, during this whole pandemic was Netflix because, and, and after this day, we'll pull this one up. Uh, one of the terms I like to look at is Netflix subscribe, right? So people that are searching for how to subscribe uh, to Netflix. And I saw just a massive, massive spike in the world. We'll look at that one in a minute. Um, but Dave will pull up the Shopify. So I have it, by the way, everyone who watches this channel knows that Shopify is one of our favorite companies. We're already knee deep into Shopify. So, uh, so what's it? So Shopify login. So here it is for, this is a uh, Shopify login is blue. Shopify cancel is red. And that's the past 12 months. Okay. There you go. Can you do a 30 day Dave? So we can see over 30 days what it kind of looks like. Yep. Okay. So not seeing any bump in cancel at all. Could we do the same thing with Netflix? Do Netflix subscribe and then Netflix cancel? On the 30-day well, the 30 day well, Actually, can't, Netflix cancel is, is going up and Netflix subscribe is... Uh, yeah, but... Wow. The, they're always going to be reversed like that. So no, go to 12 month. You got to go to 12 month. 30 day won't tell you anything on, on that Netflix. Here's 12 month. Okay. So 12. Well, more people are searching for cancel because they, you know, why would you search for subscribe? But, but just Netflix, Netflix in general. Go to, Dave, go to five year on Netflix because you got to go to five year because it's seasonal, right? So go, go to Netflix five year. Yeah. And, and you'll then you'll get to see the seasonal pattern here, okay? Yeah, and the, and this big number is just Netflix as a search term. Okay. You can see a huge spike here at the end. That but, is, but, let's get rid of Netflix, but we'll maybe pull Netflix back in a second. But let's look at just the Netflix subscribe. Yeah, here's subscribe versus cancel. Okay, so you'll see we only really get Netflix subscribe spikes um, around. Uh, uh, the holiday season uh, and, and potentially when there's a major release in a show, like a major, yeah. major release. May of 2018, that was probably show related. January uh, 2019. January, oh, is that, that, that's their holiday season when they hit right coming out yeah. of holidays. Everyone knows. But they also did their promos going into that January period. We got them this year as well, if you look. Yeah. And, that, and that's five years. Let's just look at the past 12 months. So and you can see. Our our cancel is very high right now, but but it's uh, not it's not very high though. That 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 line is essentially for Netflix cancel because it's such a small mm -hmm. term. Essentially flat for them. Uh, to, it, go to just net. I think Netflix just the word because people are really just searching for Netflix. Just the people that are actually using it, and this is really important because it's how many people are actually. I mean, look at that. That's twelve months. Netflix Dude, twelve months. Month. Do a five. This, this is the, this is their January bump here, and we are 
way higher than they've been anywhere in the past 12 months. And then here comes five years. This is this is so impressive on the five year. Look at that. Wow. That yeah. is absolutely insane to happen in March. Randomly happen in March. That is insane. Um, and, and another one that I want to look at, Dave, our other favorite stock. Let's look at Amazon. Uh, just pull up stock for Amazon. Okay, guys, you will never, ever see a bump ever in Amazon other than holiday bump and Amazon Prime and Day. Amazon Prime Day. Prime Day, right? Yeah, look and, at that. And you and you'll look, it, it happens. This is December, and this that is double Prime, Prime Day. Day. They screwed up. Remember, they did, they extended it that double Prime Day. Yeah. So, uh, go look at, I mean, that we are literally. We're we're do we're at an, a prime day style bump right now in Amazon. That is insane. That is so insane that we're getting an, a prime day style bump. And Dave, me and you talked to like 1.30 in the morning the other night for an hour about Amazon and how much we love it. And we're just doubling down on Amazon here. And Amazon really hasn't really shot up that much this week, um, only because they kind of recovered earlier this, this past week. But man, that's just never going to end for the next 60 days. Agreed? Like, it's just going to continue. That, I bet that bump flatlines here for the next 30 days. And we, we, get, we get like this nice bridge before it eventually starts to settle back down uh, when this thing comes to an end, if and when, hopefully soon. <laughs> so uh, and I see, you know, I see Amazon as like a core holding for forever. It's, it is my forever stock. Um, and I'm, I have not yet tripled down on it. I have call options that are deep in the money um, that I haven't even bothered rolling up to another strike. But Amazon's one that I want to pick more up. And we were at our two in the morning phone call. This uh, Amazon, can you even imagine what their earnings are going to look like? Unless they come out with some weird forward looking like we don't know what this is going to do to our long term business. Amazon has two things going for it. It is one of five retailers in the world that is, is still fully operational, even though their inventory is shifted mm -hmm. from like the everyday goods to now being uh, specialized in you know, necessities. Um, and when I was online trying to buy, you know, electronic equipment, things were out of stock or ship dates were a month off, um, you know, money that I would have normally spent. And I can't find hand sanitizer on Amazon still. So I, I don't even know what Amazon is able to sell right now because they're out of stock of, you know, both kinds of products for me. But they are hiring 100,000 people. Their factories are going nonstop. They uh, were down a little bit. Um, I think on the news that there were um, some out, you know, outbreak at, I say outbreak, I think six of their, you know, several hundred factories had uh, a, a single isolated case and they have, you know, responded with how they're cleaning up the operations uh, in India, I think. Was that where it was? Well, they um, no. I mean, there were some U.S. Uh, factories or um, not factories, but uh, warehouses that shut down um, just temporarily while they cleaned. But I think they've totally halted operations in India. Yeah. Yeah, and, and listen, that's going to continue, right? They're going to have more outbreaks. Uh, you know, they're going to have more positive cases in factories. I think short term uh, that will scare some investors, uh, but I think they'll figure out a way to get those to get them decontaminated and come back online. It's too important. Uh, I don't see it as a massive risk, but 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 who knows? Uh, listen, guys, someone said, hey, they're chasing keywords for confirmation bias. And uh, listen, that's not what we're doing. Understand that we're probably searching data six to eight hours a day. This is all that we do. And a lot of times on these chart lines, when it comes to the way people search and the behaviors of how they search, uh, whether you're looking at a 30 day or 12 month or a five year, there's certain companies like Netflix that have massive seasonality. So you have to understand the, the context of the bump. And that's why I was directing Dave, no switch from this chart to this chart. It wasn't because I was trying to you know, have confirmation bias of our trade. Certainly it's not something that we would ever do to ourselves because we're only trading our own money, right? Like it's, it's yeah, not we're, we're not, we're uh, literally just talking about what we do and how we got there. And you know, when, when we were searching these charts, you know what the charts are going to look like. And that's why you were saying use this search term because that's what you were trying to base something on. This next question I really like, uh, what would you do if you had a hundred percent cash right now? 
That's well, that's a great question. And I was talking to our buddy Lynn about that uh, because he basically is in 100% cash and has more cash than anyone else I know. Well, listen, it depends on the person, right? So it's what we do is not what you should do because you have a different risk profile. But what I would do yeah. is exactly what I am doing, which is being 85% long in my 15 favorite long-term stocks. I'm not trying to get fancy here. We're not actually doing a ton of social ARB trading right now. Uh, you know, yeah. we talked about Wendy's and their breakfast being a huge deal for them, but we're not even really trading Wendy's. I have a little bit of Wendy's, but we're not even doing what we normally do on this channel. Mm -hmm. We're just investing in our top dozen or so favorite long-term stocks, and we're hedging a little bit for what could be another downdraft in the market if things take a turn for the worse, and it looks like this is going to last beyond June. Um, so we talk about those stocks. We we talk we list them almost every single episode. Uh, it's Amazon, it's Lulu, it's Apple, right? It's Shopify. It's all it's these. The, it's the Fang stocks with a couple other things that we really like, like Shopify and Lulu. Yeah, I mean, it, like, it, literally, it, that's that's what we, we we like the stocks that consumers like, and and those are kind of long term holdings of ours. Um, and Disney's, and we're not Disney's another great name. Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, doc, you know, DocuSign, uh, you know, Re Restoration Hardware, uh, you know, uh, you know, th there's there these, you know, Square, right, Microsoft, you know. It, uh, Activision is one I talked about that I recently got into because I think they will they will benefit here. But there's nothing fancy. There's no, there's nothing that this is not a time for us to overthink things, right? It's just not a time to overthink. We're more focused on the market and making sure that we're prepared for the upswing. Uh, our methodology actually doesn't work very well during volatile markets. Our methodology of social ARB investing works best when we have a flat market where the things that actually move stocks is the success or failure of the underlying business, right? And that's not happening right now. What's moving stocks is people's perception of how well they'll fare under the stimulus package or under the coronavirus, right? Or whether you know the market is back or whether the market is not back. There's a lot of noise out there. So this is not really a time for us to do what we do best, which is social arb analysis. So we're just trying to keep it simple. We're trying not to overthink things. Uh, any thought on, uh, let's see, Tesla should be up there. Sales growth is crazy. Listen, Tesla is one of the stocks we're in. Uh, some of us on the show believe, truly believe in Tesla, Jordan. Some of us, <laughs> uh, some of us aren't so sure, me. Um, but even though I'm not so sure about Tesla, I'm still heavily invested in Tesla. I bought it at around, what, 415 or 420, something like that. Mm -hmm. I think I bought it in the low 400s. Um, low to mid 400s only because it, I felt that it was going to be a massive momentum stock that investors would pour back into when this thing was over with. And it could potentially be, you know, a double at that point. And I thought they had somewhat of a floor being that they had just raised massive, a massive amount of liquidity in the company, a few billion dollars. Right. So I felt the timing was right for me to have a little stake in Tesla. I don't, I'm not sure if I love it long term or not. Jordan, I know you love them. Yeah, I think I think I think midterm, like the next year or so, I think things are pretty shaky. I don't know if people are going to be just rushing out to buy automobiles. I could be wrong. I don't know. Um, but this thing definitely does shake up car purchases in the near term, and uh, they're shutting down factories and all sorts of things, and converting their factory to make um, these uh, ventilators and things. So, um, yeah, I think long term, it's a good it's a good bet, but. Can we talk also about Berkshire? I think I think long for for me Tesla is one that I haven't invested in because and I think Chris is kind of like this you're doing it because of the momentum and because of the excitement of other investors who were are going to overpay and it's going to shoot up and then you're going to try to get out you're trying to time it yeah. here is a here's an overlay of Tesla and Bitcoin for the past 6 months and while, while Bitcoin is, is way lower because of this super high spike that uh, Tesla went up to, look at those those lines. They basically are following each other in, in lockstep. So you might as well just buy crypto, Chris. <laughs> I might, I might, but I don't want to. I don't want to. It's easier <laughs> for me to buy Tesla. It's just easier. I don't have to open up a separate account. But you know what I do want to talk about also is Berkshire Hathaway. Um, listen, I, 
Warren Buffett, because someone's asking here, he said, why don't you just buy Berkshire? They have a ton of cash. They're going to be able to do some great things here. I'll tell you why I'm not buying Berkshire Hathaway. That was at Hunter Battle at 12.03, Dave, right? So let me just get this off my chest about Warren Buffett. And this is going to be a little controversial, <laughs> I know, right? Um, Warren Buffett was one of the greatest investors of the past 45, 50 years. Absolute genius. Genius in so many ways, okay? Um, Warren Buffett and his small team, in my opinion, just haven't had a clue the last decade. And the numbers substantiate that. Warren Buffett is no longer a good investor for the stock market in 2020, 2015, 2010. Uh, he's out of touch. They don't understand technology. They didn't understand Amazon. They didn't understand Apple. And it was and they eventually bought into it, right? And they, and they made quite a bit of money off it. But they're late into everything. They're late into everything. Warren Buffett is amazing at certain types of businesses, understanding the basics, which are so important because everything, everything's really about basics. He understands the basics of investing better than almost anybody in the world. But in this fast moving market with fast moving technology and massive shifts in cultural change and behavior, Warren Buffett and Berkshire Hathaway have underperformed the S&P 500 for 10 years. They have underperformed it, okay? Yeah. Underperformed the S&P 500. Now, let me just say something. That is here's, here's, even- here's, And by the way, by underperforming, if you look at it, what they're actually doing, they basically are trading with the S&P. It's because that's what they do. They, they basically are investing in the S&P. And Warren yeah, Buffett they, said, you're not going to be able to beat the S&P. And you may, you know, I'm not going to be able to beat the S&P. Right. You can. Oh, we do. I beat the S&P for the past 15 years, right? So here's the thing. What no one understands is that Warren Buffett had a natural advantage that nobody else had. After 2008, 2009, they were able to invest in banks and companies and get warrant deals because they were a distressed lender that were so spectacular. It was insane. The money that they made off of those deals was yep. absolutely spectacular. So what I'm trying to and tell if you, you go is, back to if you go back to a chart that includes 1997 on, they have done remarkable. But if you look at the last sure. five years, this is Chris's point. Yeah. Berkshire has not beaten the market at all. No, but Dave, they've done what, what I'm trying to say is if you were to remove the preferential deals that Berkshire yes. had because they had all that leverage and they had money when no one else did, if you remove those deals, I'm telling you, I bet they would be doing way worse than the S&P 500. So here's what I'm getting at. Here's what I'm getting at. Now that we have a $6 trillion stimulus package that the Fed and the Treasury gets to hand out at will, guess who nobody needs? Nobody's going yeah. to Warren Buffett going, we need you to save us and we'll give you everything. We'll give you warrants. We'll give you all these preferences. Just please bail us out. Nobody needs Berkshire Hathaway right now because they have the U.S. government with a $6 trillion checkbook, okay? So if you understand that, you understand that Warren Buffett and Berkshire Hathaway they don't have the natural advantage that they had in 2008, okay? So that's why, why would I invest in a company that's done no better than the S&P, even with the natural advantage, when now they don't even have the natural advantage coming out of this downturn? So I love you, you're an icon. I've studied you. I think you are one of the greatest investors ever. But listen, I hate to say it, you know, you're just your team, you and your team aren't built for, for two, the 2000 teens and the 2020s style investing. Now, maybe you'll prove me wrong, but I don't think so. You're late to everything now. God bless you. You've had an awesome career. I'll always look up to you, but it, I'm not going to try to replicate Warren Buffett or invest in Warren Buffett or, or, or your company because I think I can do it better. I, I'm just I think and I have, yeah. right? I have in the last ten years. 10 yeah, I agree. Years. If I were if I were to sit there with my finger on the trigger of Burke B right now, I would just switch the ticker to spy, buy that instead. Because it's gonna be about yeah. the same. Maybe yeah. maybe spy's a little bit. 
Uh, we'll see. Spy could do better than yeah. Berkshire. I mean, who knows? I mean, <laughs> no, I, I think they'll have some opportunities. By the way, they'll have some distress opportunities. They'll get the Berkshire will get to pick up some companies, and they will have some natural advantage of having all that money right now. But how many companies are going to be distressed with six trillion? I'm just not sure. There's going to be that many big distressed companies. There might be. There might be. I, I could be wrong on this. We'll see. Uh, hey, Boundless, at the end of the day, are we here? Okay. Boundless at 1210 says the disrespect, laugh out loud. It's not disrespect. The thing that I love about financial markets is that, hello, uh, we're back? Okay, so disrespect. There's not disrespect. The thing that I love about financial markets is everybody can see how well everyone does. It's just performance, right? So you can't say, I'm better than you. Let me just see how good you've done. All right, we yeah. can actually see who's good and who's not good based on actual results, okay? So you can't, there's no arguing whether someone is a good trader or a bad trader. They either have traded better than the market or have traded worse than the market. And now you can you can adjust for risk, right, and all that stuff and, and, and make cases there. But it's not, it's undebatable. It's actually undebatable, right? There's people that do well and there's people that do worse. And 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 it's and it's just financial performance, right? So no disrespect, love Buffett, but they they they've underperformed, and you got to admit when you underperform. Like what happened late last year when we made a terrible trade, mostly because of me. Okay, in QSR, <laughs> in QSR, um, it was the worst trade of my career. The worst trade. I lost seven hundred and fifty thousand dollars on a single trade in Tim Hortons, Burger King, right, and Popeyes, uh, mostly due to an oversight that I didn't recognize how poorly the Tim Hortons business was doing at that time. And there were a lot, lot of variables. But you have to come out and say when you've messed up. And, and listen, I, I've been very fortunate over the past, you know, 12, 13, 14 years in my trading, uh, turning, you know, uh, essentially generating, I think, 70 or 80%, uh, eight, 70, 90% annualized returns over uh, over a decade period annually. Um, but uh, I made it the worst trade of my career. And you have to say when you messed up, I think Warren Buffett, if you really asked him, would come out and say, I messed up. He's messed up the last 10, 10 years, right? He, he's messed up. Uh, and, and that's all. And I think he has admitted it. He's he, he has good. said, he's it, maybe not I messed up, but he has yeah. said that it is nearly impossible to beat the S&P and that um, he has a hard time beating it, which yeah. is but true. He, he well, used the amount of money that he has to invest, of course you're not going to do as well as the S&P. You, you get advantage, Chris, because you're not trading like, you know, billions of dollars. No, there are funds that trade bill that trade billions of dollars. There are a few that have consistently beat the S&P over a course of a decade, decade and a half. And by the way, Warren Buffett did it too. When he was trading billions, when yeah. he had, when he was in his zone and was in a place where he had a natural advantage and information advantage and access, he had an access advantage. When he was doing that, he mm -hmm. actually was able to, to beat the S&P year after year for a couple of decades, right? Um, but not anymore. Anyway. Yeah, so uh, do you think they have an advantage now that they have so much cash on the sideline? Uh, no, because the government has more cash on the sideline. They have six trillion on this. That's the whole exactly. point. People need Berkshire less now than they did. I still think he's going to have some advantage. Uh, he'll be able to buy some companies to stress. It will actually happen. There's no doubt in my mind they're working on deals right this second. That will probably be announced in the next 90 days. Um, so, yes, he has an advantage, but it's not as big as it used to be. That's all I'm saying. Sorry for the rant. <laughs> no, that's great. I love your rants. Uh, you, what, are there other comments that you wanted to uh, to chime in on? Uh, I know I, that you know we have questions about several individual stocks, but you know not ones that we particularly follow or, or are experts on. Well, oh, oh, can I talk about? Let's talk about uh, Ackman. Michael Crockett says Ackman. Uh, you know, for, you know, for all the crap that people gave Ackman this week when he went on CNBC. And granted, maybe he was trying to move the market down because, you know, he was still in his big short hedge position. The guy made two billion dollars and he his fund is only like five or six billion. Right. Not even. I don't even know how big it is. It's like, what, four, five, six, seven billion. He made two billion dollars. Right. Shorting the market. Uh, he started his short around the same time I did. 
And you got to give him credit. He did that with a multi-billion dollar hedge fund. That is a tremendous risk to take. He saw it and he acted on it. He had a prepared mind. We always talk about having a prepared mind. And listen, love him, hate him. Ackman had a few bad years when he made some mistakes. He got crushed on that Herbalife deal because he got into a fight with a guy with way more money than him. Of course, Herbalife is paying the price now, right? But um, I think Ackman is, is, is one of the smartest uh, – managers out there i really do i have so much respect for him mm -hmm. and uh you know he put his money where his mouth is he shorted it and, and he's out of that short now uh we'll see how he does coming out of this uh reits like realty income we don't trade a lot of reits guys it's not really our thing um i assume they would do fine in the recovery but i don't want to comment on you know you guys don't trade reits right it's not our thing right uh it's just like there's there's other opportunities that we see uh, yeah, it, it, it's the only exposure I have to real estate other than my house, um, but I'm not actively trading them. It's it's just more of like a an income play, really. Or you have you have like a REIT fund or something like that. I yeah, I have something, and it's not a substantial amount, and it's not something that I follow closely. But uh, it's part of my diversification you strategy. Like Three percent on that is it? Um, I'd have to even look, but yeah, somewhere my my smaller investments are generally in the you know one zero to like a half to one percent of my portfolio oh by the way someone says apparently they're buying a cruise line i'm assuming they're referring to brookshire halfway hopefully it's royal caribbean we'll see all right so uh hey guys a uh, conan woo right before that david 1215 any updates yep. on yelp booking and trip advice i wanted to ask you about that because those were those were big plays for us um it, at least you i was in yelp i had a huge short on yelp and i covered it for a profit. Um, I stayed out of booking and trip, but I know Chris, you were in that heavily. I killed in on all those except for, uh, I don't think, I don't know how I did in trip. It might've been kind of close to even. Uh, I, I shorted Yelp from around 30 bucks all the way down to 16, 17. I got out of it a little late. I got out of it at like 18, 19. Uh, I covered my short there. Uh, booking, I, I, I didn't ride booking all the way down. I ended up getting out of my booking at about 1400 and change, maybe 1500. I rode that down from like 20, over 2000, 21, 2200. Uh, I'm out of booking, I'm out of trip. I'm out of all of them, quite honestly. But here's the thing, you make a great, this guy, uh, Conan makes a great point. They're not getting any stimulus money, okay? Uh, you remember, they, are potentially at risk because they're not getting they might by the way they might get stimulus money there's nothing saying six trillion dollar open checkbook if they approach the government and say hey we're not a restaurant right we're not an airline but we are we're tangent to those companies and we our revenue is down 90 percent and by the way we have like 15 20 thousand workers that we're going to lay off like next week unless you give us a loan for three billion dollars two billion whatever it is i think they'll get the check don't you think the government will strike that check what are in the stimulus package there's there's stuff specifically aimed at small business with less than 500 employees there's stuff aimed at individual sectors individual companies uh what is happening in the middle ground there those companies with twenty thousand employees or, or even you know 1,000 employees. From what I've read and what I understand, they can do whatever they want with the extra $4 trillion in the uh, bond market, okay? So they can buy up those bonds, they can support those bonds, meaning these companies can issue new bonds and then they could buy them. That's what I understand. Um, even, even so they can still apply for those loans. They have, they have massive amounts of flexibility in the way it's structured to write loans to whoever they need to write them to. And they will. Um, so I think the Yelp, the booking and the trip, I think they're going to get their money if they need it. And they probably do need it. Um, so I, I'm, I'm listen at this point, now that we have stimulus passed, the risk reward has changed. I still think they're going to hurt. I still think there's downside risk there, but the stimulus is so massive, guys. It's so massive. I just don't want to fight it right now. You know what I'm saying? Like, I just, it, it scares that the government is getting more aggressive than I ever would have imagined they would ever get in my entire lifetime with supporting companies and supporting the economy, whatever it takes. You've got Trump who's like, just do it, just do it, right? Like, I don't want to like, I don't want to get in front of that. I'm not going to get in front of that. I, I would rather just, you know, lose money in the short term at the market. If the market gets a 30% down draft from here, 
I'll be 20 or 30 percent hedged, you know, so I'm still going to take a huge loss temporarily, but I'm going to take that hedge money. I'm going to reinvest it at the bottom. I'm going to lever up. And on the way up, I'll make that money back times two or times three. So I've already kind of made a decision in my head. I'm willing to do that. I'm not going to I don't think I'm going to go 100 percent hedge unless I see something unfold in the next few days that that I. I never would have imagined happen. Like, why don't we talk through those scenarios? What could happen that would be so bad in the next, call it two days to two weeks, that would force us to rethink our decision and be like, you know what? I want to go back to a hundred percent hedge scenario, or maybe even a net short scenario. Like, what what could happen? What are those scenarios? There's a few things. I mean, you could have um, you could have companies come out and say that this isn't enough. It's not, you know, big industries saying they, you know, thanks for the trillions, but uh, we need way more than that. Um, we could see a turn in the, uh, you know, a dramatic increase in the number of cases that, you know, the, the health situation could deteriorate. Dave, Dave, on that one note, you know what I think really scares me? And this would make me go negative on the market in a big way, potentially is if the numbers in China started to turn again, right? Could you imagine yep. if after all of this, the infection rate in China started to accelerate and then all of our supply chain was at risk again at the same time that we had demand destruction, now we have supply destruction that was gonna impact us infinitely into the future. That, that would be catastrophic, right? Catastrophic. Yep. What about wow. a companies turn down the deal and say, you know what, we're going to go ahead and lay off instead, right? Like, we don't like these deal terms. We don't want you owning our stock, federal government. Um, and they literally lay off like 20% of their workforce. Boeing threatened that, right? Boeing threatened that. That's why, but that's why I bring it up. I think Boeing threatened that as a negotiation tactic. Sure. They're basically saying, hey, we have options. We don't know what kind of options they have. The government, first of all, the government is weak. The government is never going to strong arm Boeing because the government by its nature is weak. OK, so they're not a distressed lender. They're not accustomed to doing this type of vulture financing. And if Boeing comes to them and says, hey, we got a better deal on the table, that deal is going to force us to lay off like 15 percent of our workforce. But the deal is really nice. And we think long term, it's better for us to take that deal. The government, you know what they're going to do. They'll be like, they're gonna, even if that deal doesn't exist, they could be lying through their teeth. And I think that Boeing CEO would lie through his teeth if he had to, right? And, yeah. and, and so I think the government would just fall apart and be like, okay, we'll give you the deal you want. Just don't lay off anybody. Okay. Like, don't you think, couldn't you see, don't you see that scenario running? So I, I, Jordan, I think you're right. That would be a catastrophe, but I don't think the government's going to let it happen. But you're right. If it does happen, it can be bad. What else we, we had have? A question. We had a question earlier um, asking my thoughts on leveraged ETFs. This is something that we've talked about before. Leveraged ETFs are mm -hmm. dangerous, but it is something that I have invested in and they're designed not to hold overnight. They're just these crazy derivative products. Um, I'm going to pull up the chart of the triple leveraged S&P 500 compared to the normal S&P 500. And you can see that historically, this um, looks like a, what, a one year time frame, maybe. This, this is before the crash. And this is when I was holding an ultra long ETF on the S&P 500. And this thing was just going up. It was going crazy. And my portfolio was going crazy. But here's here's what happens. If you're in one of these things and it's not going up or even just intraday, you could have this crazy loss. For me, this is something that I will be getting back into, but it is definitely a high risk kind of um, investment. Here, let me just fast forward for you here on this chart uh, as to what actually happened. So much like it's triple leveraged on the upside, look at that downside. So oh. it's it's perfectly stayed and it hasn't gone out of business. It hasn't gone to zero. It hasn't, you know, but you basically would have lost 60% of the money that you had in it. Now, I was able to sell at about this cross point right here. So right as, as the thing was going down, I saw my portfolio going down and I got out of it right around the time uh, it, it was basically crossing. So I lost all of these theoretical paper gains, but I didn't actually lose any money in my uh, 
crazy weirdo triple leveraged ETF. And now look at this. I'm going to be getting back in at some point, um, but nobody can time the market. Nobody can predict the market. And when you have volatility like we have, this is something I'm completely staying away from. I'm sitting in cash in the accounts that uh, I would normally try to put in this weird triple leveraged. And, and these are accounts that are money that I would be comfortable losing. I, it's, it's like going to a casino. It is not an investment. It is a <laughs> speculative play. Yeah. But that's what I'm doing. That's my history. That's where I would have theoretically made a ton of money if I had just timed the market perfectly, but nobody can time the market. And I uh, panic sold at the point where I didn't lose too much. Hey, hey Dave, uh, the NASCP at 12.18 is asking why Royal Caribbean and not NCLH or Carnival, CCL? Yep. And uh, I think the reason, you know, listen, we're, we're not experts on the cruise industry, but after doing a little bit of research, uh, Royal Caribbean is the company that has been investing the most amount of money, it appears, in its ships. It's completely built out these massive ships over the past six, seven, eight years. Um, I think they were doing incredibly well before this started. They were like just this cruise line, they were on fire before this whole thing started. And so the concept there was, through all this, they still have an awesome fleet of beautiful new mega ships. They have a massive brand, global brand, and the same reason why they were doing so well before this. Uh, you know, the concept is that they would kind of continue on that trajectory after this is over. But we didn't put a tremendous amount of time into comparing, you know, Royal Caribbean against Carnival and the other cruise lines. Uh, you know, Brian Cruz says, "I'm assuming Capital Factory is down, closed down. That's where we do all of our our meetings with startups." Uh, they're not down. They're just they've gone mobile, right? They, they've gone like uh, you know online. So we are taking a few meetings with startups, but we're really restricting those because we just don't have a lot of time with our trading and our trade research to meet with a lot of startups right now. Uh, uh, somebody asked about Medtronic. Uh, I follow them and J and J a little bit. Um, so yeah, in the long term, I think they're great. Um, but I know just in the short term, since elective surgeries and not essential surgeries are um, basically out the window right now that uh, they'll probably take a short term hit. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I yeah, that, that, that's true. I mean, there's definitely an argument to be made there. Uh, that said, how many of those will they get back when this is over? Um, you yeah, know, will they all those surgeons are pretty full. So it's like, I don't know if you gain back. I, 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 I wouldn't want to, yeah play any of that but yeah if you like it long term then I, I don't see a problem with it yeah it's one of these weird things jordan because like i totally agree that they're going to lose some business maybe for good but at the same time now that we're looking at a trump versus biden election yeah. and biden is not necessarily one of these negative uh you know he's not negative health care that i think a lot of people think the medtronics of the world will do very well no matter who gets elected the next four years so yeah. James you know, is another great name right beside Medtronic. They, they compete. Yeah. Yeah, let's see. Guys, i got to go in a minute, too, because I, I have a couple meetings. But uh, yeah, we're, um, we're coming up on the hour and a half mark. I do want to remind people who are tuning into Dumb Money Classic, the original channel. We're actually running two different streams today. I have two different laptops running because... I wanted to um, have a special message to the people watching the old channel. And so we have a um, thing that we have our faces covered and it says we're on live right now. Go to our new channel. If you're watching this old channel with us where you can't even see us, come over to the new channel. It's Dumb Money Live. All of our live streams are going to be over here on the live channel. We're going to stop streaming to the old channel because it's very confusing to the YouTube algorithm. Startup investing will happen on the old channel. The new channel is all about what we're doing here and stock market and, and that sort of thing. So come on over. We still and, have and give people us watching on the old channel. And could you give us a thumbs up and a like, guys? We'd really appreciate that. Helps the YouTube algorithm so much if you would just thumbs up and like this uh, th th this live episode. We really appreciate it. Uh, we'll try to. I'm going to try to get on all these more of these questions. If you ask questions after this gets posted to YouTube that we didn't get to today, I'll do my best, like over the next couple of days and this weekend, to get to those questions. Um, Really, really appreciate it. Listen, we'll have a very different perspective, I think, on Monday's show. Monday's show, I think we'll have a lot more information. I'm really looking forward to it. Uh, we have a lot of work to do between now and then in terms of researching trades and ensuring that our, our portfolios are right. 
uh, coming out of this. And, and what, I said I was going to do a lot of research on something. Do you remember what it was? Uh, well, we already talked about it. You were going to do research on the uh, gaming, the video game stock. No, stocks. for next week. For for next episode, I oh, said for next that, week. What was that stock? Oh man, what was that? I'll have to look through the comments. Go back and watch the archive. I'll, I'll go. Back, I'll go back. We'll have a replay. Back. Someone else. Someone post it in the comments, and and we'll uh we'll know what to what Chris is supposed to research. We can just roll through some uh, some of these comments if you want. Um, pe people's thoughts on. There's so many comments. Uh. Seems like Trump is preparing the market to pump after the virus. Every press conference is like, oh, yeah, we're, we're going higher. There's so much pent up demand. We kind of talked about that. We talked about the uh, pharmaceutical stocks. Um, secondary outbreak in China would be a scenario that, that we would be very uh, concerned about. And the fact that uh, what our our national science, what's his name? He's basically saying this could turn into a seasonal version of the flu and and is this something that i'm ready for a seasonal lockdown but i don't know that our economy is <laughs> hey dave dave well that'd be okay because once we get the vaccines ramped up we can tweak them just like the regular flu vaccine that won't be an issue long term but well, over a year away over a year away on the back. I, I, I know i i know i know it, it, that's that's the risk right the risk is if we can't figure this out by summer I think there could be a lot more downside on this market for sure. And we'll know that pretty soon. Uh, someone want to ask if I was investing in uh, uh, TVA and AMRX due to hydrochloroquine, uh, chloroquine, which is the drug, which is the drug that's been around forever that Trump is talking about that might be the savior. I don't think it's going to be the savior. I think for every, all, I did a ton of research on it and it looks like it could be a very helpful therapeutic that could absolutely help people in worst case scenarios. But I don't think it's like a cure all magic bullet. But even if it was, to my understanding, it's like a generic drug and it's really cheap. Right. So I don't think, and it's only for people that are, you know, really have the condition. So I don't know that there's a tremendous amount of money for a large drug company to make off that one old generic drug. Whereas and as a generic drug, everyone starts making it and the government is mandating that you have to make it and they're mandating a set price that you're not allowed to sell it above. So it, to me, that, that, that's not really an investment play. But, but, all, but also, have you ever tried day trading, Chris? Here, No, no, that's not what we do. We don't do that. At least, and we don't time markets. Like we've tried really hard to time. This was timing a black swan event, which is different than timing a market. Um, I have been preparing to time black swan events for literally decades of my life. I, in my off time, I study black swan events. I, I have been waiting for the next one to happen. And I was at right time, right place with a prepared mind when this one was in its early stages in China. And that's why I was able to time this market. But timing markets is not something that I'm good. Could you attest to that, Dave Jordan? I do not do that well at all. Like I will- No, we, we are historically terrible at timing the market. And I think pretty much everyone who's ever tried to time the market is, yeah. you just can't do it. And my, anytime I'm trying to, uh, basically be have a sure thing. I just wait until Chris says, I think this is the top or this is the bottom. Yeah. And I do the opposite because yeah. one of us is going to win and it's usually the opposite of what he thinks. Right. I've been so tempted to yeah. chase this thing up every time. And I've, you know, I've, I've got to stop and just say, let's wait, be patient. Yeah. I, I, so I, why I invest in, so I know, I know you're invested in Zoom and I didn't get into Zoom. Um, why invest in Zoom and Skype, FaceTime, Hangouts and Discord all exist? Um, well, it, it, we talked about this quite a bit in our last episode. It's it's about branding and customer acquisition and stickiness, right? So it really doesn't matter if four of them exist because none of them are prohibitively expensive. And the one that people get on first and have a good experience with, and they think that is the leading brand and it turns out to be sticky. And then those are the guys that get the most money in terms of capital injections and they can afford to actually set up distribution and have proper customer service. So, and it's all about branding guys. It's like anything else, it, like any other industry sector, right? I think Zoom I just want to mention that that comment came from a person called Ham Puddle. I love these uh, these <laughs> usernames. Um, Brian, Brian, one of our regular viewers, says that he loves the idea of doing a fan Zoom uh, happy hour with dumb money. So we we need to just follow us on all of the other socials because that's probably where we'll uh, publish uh, yeah. the date and time for that, and just like an open password for anyone to join in. That, yeah, that would be a lot of fun. I'm up for it. Uh, Virgin Galactic, you know, we bought that for a little bit, sold it. Like, 
I'm not getting super speculative right now. There's too many sure things to, to mess around with highly speculative stuff. And by the way, me and Jordan, uh, me and Dave, we made our investment in uh, – in uh, SpaceX, SpaceX. So now it would kind of, I kind of feel like I'm fulfilling my space trade. You have your space that. fantasy. That's all yeah. you need. <laughs> so I, I don't need more space in my portfolio. Um, but yeah, that's it. Hey guys, thanks so much for watching. Uh, we'll be back on Monday and with a lot more to talk about on Monday. Like I have, I, I just have a lot of work to do this weekend. And I need to remind you to do hit that, uh, that like button for the YouTube algorithm. We need you to do that. Uh, if you're not subscribed to this channel, please subscribe. Turn on notifications. We are a brand new channel. YouTube doesn't like to promote brand new channels as much. So turn your notifications to all because this is where you're going to find our live content. Um, subscribe to our original Dumb Money channel. I'm actually going to finally put out the episode that has been kind of just sitting in the queue for a while because we're not meeting with anyone and we never shot the ending for that one. So I'm going to here today film a little ending that just says goodbye and I'll publish that probably in the next day or so. So subscribe to our original Dumb Money channel, youtube.com slash Dumb Money. Subscribe here. Subscribe to my other channel. Hey there, Dave here. Um, catch up with our episodes on the podcast, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google. We're on all of them. Anything else, guys? No, that's it. Like I said, if you have questions we didn't get to today, when this episode's posted, repost the question. And over the next few days, we're gonna I'm gonna try to get to all those questions. Um, sorry if we haven't been as responsive as normal. Just know that we're up till 1:32 a.m. and up at six doing market research, uh, individual equity research. This is all we do. Uh, you know, hour after hour, not getting a lot of sleep. We're doing our best to get to comments, guys, but we're working. And we're gonna do another show. You want to do Monday or Tuesday? I, I think, uh, you know, hopefully it's, let's try to get back into the Tuesday, Thursday. So let's do Monday. No, let's let's do Monday. Monday. I feel like so much happens over the weekend. We should do Monday and Thursday. Monday yeah. is kind of like, this is the big day. And Thursday is a wrap up for the week. Yeah. To to totally, totally agree. Totally agree. All right. Thanks All right, guys. Perfect. Thanks for watching. We're done money. We'll see you next time.